Welcome to Ranger Rob Has Your Back, a show that features your business, your services, your products. On Ranger Rob Has Your Back, you are the star. Let Ranger Rob be your advocate. Let's get started. Hey everybody, this is Ranger Rob and welcome to Ranger Rob Has Your Back. And today we have Nikki and Keenan from, let's see if I say it, Sprague River Homestead. Is that correct? That's yep. correct. <laughs> So nice to meet you guys. So we stumbled on each other uh, because um, obviously we have a homestead channel too, or country living. You're more homestead than we are, so that's why we call it country living. <laughs> so anyway, it was like, where in Central Oregon is other homesteaders? And I found you guys, and I have been watching your channel. And, and what I want to do is everybody's listening right now. If you want to see a fascinating channel about homesteading, and I'm talking real homesteading, these folks are the guys a lot. So I want to remind everybody right now, first of all, to go down to the description. You'll find the links to, do you guys have a Facebook channel? We, yeah, Facebook? we have Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Okay, we'll make sure that all that's down in the description um, before this video goes out. And uh, I urge you to subscribe to their channel. Make sure you go check out their Facebook. And if you're interested in getting into homesteading or be getting into the country and stuff, these folks could probably teach you a lot, <laughs> especially about poultry and rabbits. So we'll get into that in a minute. So you guys, I got to ask, because we all have our stories. In fact, before we started this show, you kind of asked, like, how did I get where I'm at? So before you ended up where you're at today, and we will talk about where you're at today, what were you doing before you were homesteaders? How far back do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a long story behind me too. But generally, what were you guys career people? Do you have careers? Were you book? You know, were you working for corporations or? Um, did you I even live in the country? Over twenty years back to Tennessee. <laughs> sure. Okay, so twenty years ago, I wanted to be the next Garth Brooks, so we moved to Nashville. <laughs> cool. So I graduated college. We moved to Nashville. I have a degree in engineering, so we moved there. Um, and after about a year of songwriting and trying to play little clubs and everything else, I realized that probably in 10 years, I was going to be nowhere. And I had a degree in engineering. So I went and started the career piece. So I got into automotive and just left automotive like two weeks ago. So I've been doing that for 20 years. I would say the homesteading yeah. piece, um, I'm a suburb kid. So I grew up the cold cul-de-sac, you know, the old suburbs and all the kids skateboarding, BMX biking and all that stuff through that. So I was never into homesteading or country living until we moved to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And about a year into that, we had a place in Tennessee that was 12 acres. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that was probably oh. the beginning. I would say country living more than homesteading, but I never had anything beyond a dog or a cat. So we had llamas, we had geese, we had wow. cats. Well, we didn't have any dogs, but. Yeah, we didn't have any dogs. That was about it at the Tennessee house. Yeah, and so we had neighbors that were, I guess they would they would define what the, the term redneck looks like. They're general country boys, you know? And so, um, I don't know. I guess that was probably our first thing in the country living. And then the homesteading really probably started in Mississippi. So okay. we were in Tennessee so, for six or, years. Or you or, gotta, before you leave Tennessee, though, okay. um, make sure your volume's down a little bit. I think we're getting a little feedback. But um, uh, for you, so when did you get you two meet? Um, we <laughs> met in 97, 1997. Hmm. And so, did you get, are you, um, are you guys hooked up or, uh, <laughs> uh, nowadays you don't assume everybody's married. So I assume you guys are a couple. Yeah, we got, we got married five. We got married in 02, July of gotcha. 02. We, uh, yeah. we met online in an internet chat room in 1997 when my mom was convinced everybody online was an ax murderer waiting to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to meet you, uh, each other on like farmer dating site or something. <laughs> Like, no, no he was that, a total city boy at that point. None of that existed, really. <laughs> there wasn't, like, online dating sites back then. This is pre-that. Well, that's true, yeah. yeah. Was back, everything yeah. was DOS-based. 
That's right. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember there was, there was, we, we started yeah, there um, cutting edge webs back in 2000 and we we're, you know, that was just when things were starting up as websites and stuff. And uh, um, now when I look at what we're doing today, I mean, we we're working hard just to make websites. Now everybody can do it in two minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. Now you yeah. got sites like Wix or whatever else that is here, pick yeah. your colors and do this and put in your pictures and done. Yeah. So you guys, you guys got married and you, um, uh, so did you move up here after you were married? Yes. Yeah. So we left Tennessee in 05 and moved down to Mississippi. So I, I was in automotive. So I went to work for a, a global auto manufacturer in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So we moved down mm -hmm. there and we went from 10 acres in Tennessee down or 12 acres in Tennessee to 10 in Mississippi. And so we you had make, you're making things. me feel really bad. You know that, don't you? You know, I only have like measly five. <laughs> well, I mean, there are times I mean, that we wish we only had five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that many times. The the ten was enough. You know, we had we still had. I think at the time we got down there, we brought llamas with us because she's had llamas for 25, 30 years now. Had them since ninety three. So almost 30 years she's had llamas. So we brought llamas uh -huh. from Oregon down to Tennessee, took them to Mississippi. And then we, we brought them back to Oregon. So, gotcha. So, uh, we had, now, now, now you're in Mississippi. How did you end up here in Oregon? Well, it was kind of a couple of things. He had burnout from the automotive industry, just yeah. it's a high stress environment. Gotcha. And at the same, same time that we were talking about moving back, because my family is all here, oh, uh, my, dad, my dad actually came up with colon cancer at that same time. So it kind of drove the point home that we were a long way from family. Dad went through surgery and chemo and all that and came out fine. He's clean now. In fact, they live two miles from us up the street. Oh, nice. So. nice. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of driven back to country living for family, too. So we mm -hmm. totally understand that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. now you guys are, I'm, I'm going to use the word a little bit more extreme than we are. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> and and no, would, would, would you guys tell yourself that? <laughs> would, would you uh, call yourselves true homesteaders? Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I you'd almost have to put a little bit of modern in there just because yeah. I think it depends on what your definition of homesteaders is, though. I, but I true. really it's more of doing doing the most with what you have available. I think yeah. it's really what and we're the definition to do. I've read is uh, uh, to be as self reliant as possible. Right. We is work for I, it. Every every project is trying to get a little bit closer to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, what drove you to be more self sufficient? What, what's well, some of the reason? Couple, it was a couple of things. So, I where he was the suburb kid, I was not. So, my grandparents raised racehorses, and uh, my family has a big background in logging. We had farms when I was growing up, so we always had chickens and turkeys. I was the weird kid in high school that skipped prom to go to a llama show. <laughs> so we were always doing other stuff. So I grew up kind of doing all of this stuff, moved out and thought, I'm, I'm not going to do any of this anymore. You know, I'm going to go live in the yeah. city and yeah. just decided that it wasn't really for me. You know, the apartment living with everybody hearing you and this didn't really work out very well. But where I got him on board was when he first moved to Jackson was about the same time that Kat, uh, Katrina, Katrina came into Mississippi and knocked all the power out within, what, two, three weeks of you moving. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of got the idea that, you know, we need to probably be a little bit more self-contained than we were. Yeah. And that was kind of the big, big step for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I got to ask, let me add this one onto it, but are you guys also um, uh, preppers? Or do you, and I, I, sometimes I hesitate to say preppers, but do you like to be prepared more? I think all homesteaders are preppers. If, if for not a long-term type thing, we're always preparing for the next season anyway. I mean, that's yeah. why we garden and can and put firewood away. So I think in, in that kind of vein, all homesteaders are preppers. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I ju we just hit gold mine on canning jars. At Bymart, they came in with we, like cases. We've kind of come and gone with that. We've, 
we live in more of an agricultural area here so people tend to find stuff and they buy it out as quick as they can so yeah, yeah. Well, we, we bought all everybody was day, around us. i think we bought like four cases because <laughs> we were like <laughs> well you're not gonna find these I had to laugh because sherry went to uh take her mom to a doctor's appointment and she and uh took care of that and she stopped by bar by martin and so she comes back and she goes i hope you're not mad at me but they had canning jars you know we already have some but mm -hmm. oh no they had all the different sizes and pallets of them so oh, she wow. did load it up <laughs> the whole car was full of them. <laughs> so we're in such good shape but i did not expect that we we're going to see more canning jars but um because they're, they're saying they actually in waves. i know it's yeah. really strange so but uh well, so yeah getting back to you guys though <laughs> <laughs> anyway so you guys uh you um how did you find now you guys are on a hundred acres correct mm -hmm. so wh when you came to oregon did you plan on buying that much land or did you uh um what was your specifications of what you wanted when you did get up here so we we got here and, and the home we live in now was originally a vacation property for mm -hmm. her parents and so right around the time that we were thinking of moving in that we i was going to leave a big factory and i didn't really know how to live in an agricultural setting so my mind i was going to look for another factory job or another manufacturing job which is my background so we were going to stay here for upwards of a year and this little house was it's a little house in the middle of the woods it's on 20 acres only and we kind of got here and I don't know, we just never, I guess we never really found that itch to go north, like to Portland or Salem or anything more urban than where we are. And so my biggest thing was in order to be able to hunt on your own land, you need to be able to have 160 acres. And that's a, a law or rule in Oregon. Yeah, it's a... Uh... I can't remember what it's called, but it's a tag right thing. Yeah. So oh, in order okay. to have tag rights on your own property, you had to have 160 acres. So in my mind, I was thinking, well, if I want to hunt here, I'm going to, I'm going to go get 160 acres. And so we got here, got the 20. It just so happened that the property next to us, which is 40 acres, it's kind of was available. Um, the owner of it at that point lived in, I think in Oklahoma. No, he'd moved to Missouri. Missouri. And so he knew my dad and called and said, Hey, you know, I really want to get out from underneath this. I'm never coming back. And so dad bought us the 40 acres and we've had to pay him back. And then we bought another piece behind it. And then we hit a hundred acres and we just thought, Oh my gosh, this is so much work. I don't know if we want another 60. <laughs> So yeah, we yeah, just yeah. kind of stopped at the 100 and yeah. just kind of left it there. <laughs> yeah, the other pieces, I mean, it was, it, we had 20, we bought 40 because it was available and it was the right price. And then the 60 behind us came available. It became a, a widow and her son came up one before I moved up here because Nikki was here a year before I was. They came up and they were at the same place. They they didn't really want the land anymore. Um, they had a price in in mind and it was a good price to us so we bought that and we ended up selling 20 of that acreage of that 60 to another neighbor which oh, got us down right. to, got us down to the hundred and then at this point nobody else really wants to sell nothing around us is buildable so it's kind of it's not really worth much and nobody really wants to give it up so we're not going to push the issue yeah i don't really see any reason to pay taxes on it if i'm not going to use it at the moment yeah. so <laughs> not that taxes are very high here but still yeah so okay so now you get this property and you finally build it up to 100 acres and uh so uh imagine a little um uh, trials and, st and error of course uh so you I, I know you're starting to focus on some pr primary um like rabbits and poultry but I, I know you have other animals too but um what are some of your lessons learned about things that you maybe used to do and and found out it's just not in your best interest as far as maybe i don't are you still doing the llamas um no there's just no market in llamas anymore when yeah. we started off back in 1983 they were still going for five to ten thousand dollars a piece yeah. 
Wow. And nowadays, yeah, they're worth about 500 if you can really find a buyer for them anymore. Yeah. I'm probably so, going to start doing some more llama stuff in the next couple of years, though, because I'd really like to get back into training them for packing, which is what I used to do when I was in high school. Yeah. And uh, they really are a superior pack animal, but it's them. getting a herd built back up and getting back to training. And I'm getting older, so I'm not yeah, sure if I, I want to be fighting those 300 pounders anymore. <laughs> yeah. So um, as you did the transition and as you've gotten experience, um, from what you did raise to what you raise now, and then we'll start getting into all the things you raise now. What are things you learned about things you decided to give up and not do anymore? Um, and maybe new things that you started to get into that you didn't before. Well, we're always tweaking what we have around here. Um, mm -hmm. We're in kind of a harsh environment. I mean, even more so than where you're at in central oh, Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can get sure. frost. Yeah, we can get frost and freezes every single month of the year. Uh, it, we go below zero quite a bit. We've been as low as 30 below. And then, of course, in the summer, we can go over 100 degrees. So we're constantly tweaking what we've got around here. And what we found is this is, is the breeds and varieties of stuff that we did in Tennessee and Mississippi don't adapt here very well. For sure. Of course. So. We bring stuff in all the time and we give it a year or two. And if we're not getting the production we expect to see out of it, we cut things loose and start over. And yeah. I've done that with turkeys and chickens and all the rest of it. So your, your priority in being self-sufficient is uh, has been, uh, I, I'm going to see if I miss anything, has been gardening. I know I have caught some of your gardening uh, um, techniques that you're using. And some of them are wonderful. And uh, well, yeah. You know, just doing anything is wonderful um, as long as you're trying. And, uh, and um, believe me, I don't know what good and bad is. <laughs> so, um, and I've noticed you're, you've got your own um, and you're doing animals and you're doing it for, for food too, and for breeding. And, and my other observation is um, uh, you're um, I've heard you talk on some of your shows where you're talking about trying to stay debt free, keeping, um, costs or, or bills low and changing your way of life so you can sustain a lifestyle like this which we're doing the same thing totally understand that um what are uh, and and being more so self-sufficient i've noticed i saw you one video about you fixing the generator with a mouse in it that was, <laughs> that was fascinating i couldn't believe what a mouse could do to a generator <laughs> I was the same way because, you know, about burned us out. But, yes, <laughs> it's amazing what a little what a little mouse yeah. can do. I mean, you're just joking. I thought you were joking on the video going, yeah, they just about burned down my house. It's like, yeah, right. He's just, you know, that's clickbait, you know. And I go to your video and I'm going in there and goes, dang, he's right. I mean, he could, that could have caused the no, fire. I mean, it, it really, I think if we wouldn't have caught it and been right there to stop it, you know, we were near the house, thankfully, but I, I, there's been times, um, our cooling fan is manual. So I, when I first moved here, I didn't have the repetition and, and down for it. And there was one time I didn't turn the cooling fan on and the thing overheated and I was at the barns and I was, you know, 400 feet down the driveway. I couldn't run fast enough to get it turned off Yeah. before it damaged anything. And yeah, that was an amazing story. That was a really good I, mean, I hate to say that was a good video because it really wasn't a I mean it was good video for lessons learned, but it was not a good for what happened. Um yeah. so one of the things I gotta ask about you guys is uh, um I I'm sure just like me and Sherry, we're going through lessons learned all the time. But um uh so you guys have gone kind of extreme. I mean, you you're out there, I mean, you're you're out there a ways. Is there times that you ask yourself, was it too much, too far, too, too, uh, too rural, too out, <laughs> out there? Do you make, you know, do you ever have, I mean, you have drawbacks no matter what. If you lived in the city, it's too many people. You go rural, it's, you know, hustle, bustle. And if you go out in the country, is it too far out? Uh, what are some of your observations of being, you're farther out than we are. I know that. I, I would say the, the first time, I mean, I've had lots of moments where I've thought, I don't know if I should have been doing this because the first year I was here alone. So mm -hmm. I, our place kind of sits, we're bordered by national forest. So our closest neighbor is just over a mile as the crow flies. Mm -hmm. And 
coming from a smaller property with lots of neighbors to be down here by yourself was a little bit terrifying. And I like to think I'm pretty tough, but it was still pretty terrifying. But I know the one moment that I was just like, maybe we live too far out was when we got 18 inches of snow overnight. And we have three quarters of a mile of forest service road that we have to maintain. Yeah. And I had, it took me eight hours with the tractor and bucket to get enough snow off the road to get out. And it's not that we needed to go anywhere, but it was just the <laughs> idea that if something happened, we couldn't get out. Yeah. So it's just like, uh, I, no matter where you live, if you have two cars and both your cars are broke down, maybe the wife's got one and one's broke down. You, you just panic. Cause like, even though there's absolutely no way, no place you need to go, just knowing that one car doesn't work. <laughs> Yep. Same thing. It just drives me crazy. So yeah, I totally understand that feeling. So before I forget about the animals, I want to get back to. So you guys have started. I've noticed you focused on uh, raising rabbits and uh, breeding rabbits and rabbits for eating. I assume I, I haven't caught a video when you talked about eating so much as we were breeding, um, and then poultry. Um, and so, what do you? Uh, what do you, what has been your goals with let's start with rabbits um uh what are you guys doing with rabbits as far as uh, uh generally are, are you breeding are you making meat rabbits uh, what uh, what are you doing show rabbits um what what's the scoop so i had rabbits off and on growing up just the assorted weird five dollar pet that you pick up at the feed store <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I don't know. I've always loved them. Uh, when we were still in Mississippi, I talked him into letting me get meat rabbits because that was kind of getting to be a big thing. That was about 15 years ago, probably 13 years ago, somewhere in there. Uh, the, the meat rabbits were really starting to take off. So I got a whole bunch of weird stuff and then we ended up moving them here. And that's what we were doing with them is just raising meat and selling, you know, oddballs every now and then for somebody who wanted to get into it. Yeah. And I got some rabbits from, I want to say I picked up, I had picked up two in Mississippi and then I picked up one when I moved here called a Harlequin and they kind of yeah. look like a calico cat yeah. and they're cool looking. And so I kind of got into it. I met a lady here locally to me that was breeding them for show and I had never thought about showing them because I had done show llamas for years and it's so much work getting llamas ready yeah. for show. It's weeks of grooming. And I just thought this is too much. And I started breeding them and she said, you know, you really ought to come with me to a show. And that was uh, about five and a half years ago. And it's kind of snowballed. <laughs> so I breed for show and I breed for meat. Uh, we do have one small breed that's really not good for much, but pets and show animals. But um, we are now teaching rabbit classes. I have, I have gotten so much into the rabbit thing. I'm actually currently the um, American Harlequin Rabbit Club president right now. Oh, and I sit on boards for a couple of different other clubs. And uh, usually in a normal year, I go to about 15 shows in a year. This year, uh, that's I think I went to two before the whole world shut down. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, we we do a little bit of everything. The rabbits um, are actually paying for themselves, and uh, yeah. I don't know. I I love them, and they're just kind of my passion, I guess. Yeah. So, um, are you um trying to do full circle with your rabbits? Like, do you um like one of the most magical fertilizers out there is rabbits? Oh so yeah. Are you you're turning all that in uh, from? you know, raising to the bunnies to selling the uh, that and then also any of their droppings, taking the recycling, anything, putting it into the gardens and all that. It's a full cycle for you guys, I assume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The only thing we don't do, and it's just a time thing, is I don't tan my own pelts for the most mm -hmm. part. Unfortunately yeah. they they get recycled, um composted or just in the trash. Cause I just don't have the time with everything what? here. It's a I hard problem. It's not hard, but it, it's a. I mean, it's a time-consuming practice, and it, you it gotta, is. and you gotta babysit it too. I mean, you gotta uh, when you're tanning. I do know that. I've never done it, but I know folks that have, and uh, they're really cool. There's no doubt, but uh, they are more work, and it's not like you guys don't have enough work now, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's move over to poultry because I'm kind of going by what you named your homestead, which is rabbits and poultry. So what's up with the poultry? Well, I grew up with chickens. Uh, my mom is a chicken nut. She loves them. I honestly don't like them a whole heck of a lot, which is kind of strange. <laughs> but they produce eggs and they produce good meat. So it feels yeah. like, you know, that's something you've got to have on the homestead. My passion is more in uh, my turkeys. I've been doing turkeys yep. well, I I did in high school. Uh, but we do five different varieties of turkeys now. And I just love them. I think they're the coolest things. I, they're ugly yeah. sit, but I think they're cool. <laughs> I, I, I grew white turkeys. I know exactly what you mean. I fell in love with them. <laughs> and my kids would go out and make high notes to them, and they all gobbled. They just, you know, the kids loved it too. It was a great time. And um, I've done the bronze, but the bronze don't seem to get as big as the white ones as far as the ones yeah. I got. And, uh, but yeah, turkeys are fun, no doubt. Dumb, but fun. <laughs> Yeah, and more outgoing, more personable. Like, I've very seldom ever been attacked by a turkey, but I've been yeah, yeah. attacked by an awful lot of roosters in my life. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, you know, we had the game bird farm, I was telling you, and we had some really, you know, we used to have all varieties of pheasants and checker, and we used to get some of the exotic ones. And we had uh, one that my kids still to this day talk about is the set a set of silver pheasants we had, which mm -hmm. were insanely mean. And they had spurs that long. I'm not kidding you. And I said we'd be chased every day trying to feed them. It's like they're and so they to this day we still say that damn silver roasters. <laughs> you know, those things are mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> I've always wanted a set of goldens, but I just can't justify the expense of them. I I just we don't have a lot of room for pretty stuff, and yeah, they're just I pretty. I hear you. Um yeah, we have all forms of them. We had uh uh, we call them vul Vulcans. Um, they're uh, blue. Um, they're great big pheasants. They come from Philippines. And uh, I can't remember the name of them now. I'm getting, it's been 20 years. But, um, yeah, we had all kinds of them. And, and all of them had different needs. And so to take care of all those different varieties can be tough because what one set of birds can handle, the other ones can't, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. So, um, so. What have been now? You're now the world's changed a little bit. Obviously, we got the COVID stuff, and now we got a different leadership and stuff. So, um, without I'm not talking politics, but just generally what our world's going under, what are some of your concerns uh, as a homesteader based on some of the things that could change? Um, or maybe it would be better or worse, or what are things that are your concerns as a homesteader that you would pass on to someone else getting into homesteading or country living? Well, I know for us down here, uh, one of the things that we see every single year is the, um, the building codes on property Ooh, yeah. is changing. And you're seeing a lot of stuff that used to be buildable that's being rezoned or deer migration patterns or whatever mm. it is and that seems to be a lot more difficult um the septic requirements on yep. new properties are getting much much more difficult it's getting harder and harder all the time for people to build on their own property that they, they seem to think if you're not a contractor that you shouldn't be touching anything yeah um, and I've then of course for, yeah and, and of course for us um, the rising costs of the things that we can't grow ourselves. You know, we have five LGDs, uh, livestock guardian dogs, mm. plus two house dogs. And while we feed them quite a few meats and things off the farm, we can't grow all the dog food that we need. And that is continuously getting more and more and more expensive all the time. Yep. And that's kind of the, our biggest thing is concern over the things that we can't grow for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like it's, not cost effective to grow wheat, but flour is getting hard to find as we saw this spring and the prices of it are just going up all the time. Yeah. So uh, are you uh, changing any of your uh, homesteading practices um, because of the, of the threat of maybe shortages uh, on food and things like that? Are you, is that something that's in the back of your mind a lot? Like me and Sherry, we, you know, we we're, there's certain things we know we will not be able to grow, so we're buying more of those things and storing them more. At the same time, it's like we're what 
we would normally have a smaller garden now has grown to a much bigger garden and we're building a greenhouse because we're concerned about foods. Are those some of the same thoughts that are going through your heads too? I think, yeah. I, yeah. This is the first time that I've even bothered to have a fall garden. Usually by September, October, our first really good freezes, we pretty much call it, you know, a year on the garden and move on because usually I'm off at rabbit shows and we're doing other stuff, but this year we're doing a fall garden and we're growing stuff through the winter. Uh, we've started growing more and more feed for um, the the poultry and the rabbits in particular. Mm. And we're hoping to get some more fields fenced off for the goats because we do goats too. And it's, I mean, yeah, we've started stockpiling a little bit on some stuff and just learning how to make do without some things like, um, I'm dabbling again a little bit in making pasta and I already bake our bread, but you know, I, I learned how to do sourdough this year along with millions of other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, did too. yeah, we just did a video about, uh, she got a, a starter going. And uh, so we're going to have all these different forms of sourdough stuff. And actually it's been really cool, but uh, nothing like we call it the blob. <laughs> yeah, got a, feeding yeah. the blob. What's that? You cut out a little bit. And you sit it on the counter and just kind of watch it grow. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, so Sherry, actually, we stopped doing it because it's like, I'm going through tons of flowers just trying to keep the starter going. And so uh, mm -hmm. we finally, we finally stopped, but we've been running a starter for about two or three months now. And it's been kind of fun and we want to learn how to do it, but just, you know, um, just in case things get tough with yeast and things like that, it's like, oh, some of these little practices we want to learn how to do. So just yeah. in case, you know. But uh, so uh, I didn't get into the other. So you said you had goats. Do you, um, uh, what, why do you have goats? Well, for me, the goats have always been fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like goats as part yeah. of it. But when we got here, um, our main 20 acres and now the the other two parcels that we own, have a lot of sagebrush because that's just what everything is down here and goats yep. love it they absolutely think it's goat crack so we yeah. have the goats basically clear land at this point uh we do have a lot of dairy breeds so we're going to start doing our own milk this year usually mm -hmm. i just let them raise their kids and go on with it but right. our herd is up to almost 30. <laughs> so wow. and yeah. do they, i gotta ask you do they eat cheat grass They'll eat just about anything. Yeah. I mean, they wow. really will eat. They don't like the cheatgrass as much when it finally dies off and gets real nasty, but they'll mow cheatgrass down before it starts to actually get hard and, and be a nuisance. I, I um I when I lived here before, I actually had two Jacob sheep. And, and of course they told me, Oh yeah, they'll they'll eat the cheatgrass. No, they tippy toed around all of it except the cheatgrass. And the only reason they're going to get a getting rid of cheatgrass is because their hoofs kind of tore up the ground, but uh, they were useless. <laughs> so I was just curious how your goats did. So they do great. Yeah. I mean, they're they're really part of the long term. I, I call it terraforming because they they are really they clear off all the natural vegetation. They leave behind fertilizer. Hell yeah! Basically, what comes back? Everything we've allowed them to eat all the sagebrush off. They'll clear it out one year. It'll be sticks the next year that they tend to break off. And about year three, you really start to see grass come back, natural yeah. wildland grass, because they won't let, allow the sagebrush to come back. They'll, they'll yeah. come the grass, but they won't do anything else. So do you rotate the, the goats where they'll have a certain area and you let them work it down and then move them to another section and then, and then maybe throw, throw a mixed seed into the areas they left? and see if it kind we, of replenishes itself? We haven't as much as we would have liked because we've been doing other projects, but the goats are, are going to be the focus for this next year and pastures and moving stuff around. We have let them clear two different spots that in the spring, I'm going to go ahead and reseed with new grass mm -hmm. and uh, try and get some new pasture started. Yeah. Now are you grow, uh, raising goats for consumption at all? Uh, the plan has always been whatever doesn't sell, we'll eat. And that's yeah. kind of the way you look at a lot of things. That's how we do the rabbits and the turkeys. Uh, so far, I have been blessed to sell everything that I put up for sale. 
So we have not had to eat any of the goats yet, but that's certainly on the table. We're not afraid of yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I want to go, we touched on it a little bit, but uh, for energy purposes, because um, especially you being out where you're at, you probably have a lot of power outages and things like that. I assume that when you bought your place, were you on the grid? No, no. it was never on the grid. It's it's It had a well <laughs> dug, but it, it had no power. Oh. The power lines we have are three quarters of a mile away, and they're the high power. Yeah. So in to put power down here, her parents got quoted from the electrical company that they would have to put in a complete uh, transformer station. It would be about a quarter million dollars. Wow. 12, yeah. 15 years so ago. So you, yeah. you guys are truly off the grid as far as electrical, yes. correct? Yeah, we are and 100% off-grid solar. We've always been for six years now. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, in, right after I moved and... We have our own well and septic and all that. We don't have any utilities to this place. Do you um, uh, do you utilize solar at all? Yes, we are 100% solar powered. Oh wow! Um, so you're running quite a few panels and the whole works and yeah. Um, do you have it, like yeah. a battery a battery yeah. bank type thing that you're working off of and it yeah yeah oh, wow. But um, and then you have the bat and then the generator probably to top off the batteries pretty much yeah you know the days that we get a lot of snow or there's just cloud cover you don't make enough power with solar you've got to do something you either sit with no power and and allow your batteries to work extra or we just go fire up the generator for a couple hours wow i didn't realize you guys were that far i mean really off the grid that much that's amazing so yep. uh, that's great and see i i did write some notes down i haven't even looked at them uh, i gotta ask what um I take it there's no, I haven't seen in any of your videos, no kids involved here, right? Nope. Nope. We were not so blessed. So all of our kids have four legs. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, so uh, I was going to ask you, have you guys always been homesteaders and, and we got that story. So that's amazing. And why, uh, I hope I covered the why, because a lot of this, I'm trying to answer these questions that people would want to ask you or thinking about homesteading. Why homestead? I mean, what would you generally say? Why why should we homestead? I think it's more or less trying to do the most you can for yourself. And just really, I she grew up in the country. I grew up in the city. And the thing didn't really click to me of why to even try. Because it was, it was living through Katrina and seeing, you know, devastation of land, property, and then people. I mean, people turned on them on each other. I mean, if then families and all that, it just it was heartbreaking to see it. It was scary. Because yeah. I had just moved to Mississippi. I'd been there three weeks. I was staying with some friends I, I knew. Uh just started a new job. I didn't know anybody. And then here comes this this hurricane and basically, you know, leveled New Orleans pretty close and came so far inland. You know, I was stuck living with some friends. Yeah. You know, the gas shortages and that. And, you know, when I went back to Tennessee on the weekends, back to our place there before I moved, I'd come home with a bed full of gas cans because it was plentiful where, where Nikki was in Tennessee. But you'd wait an hour in line to get a tank of gas and then gas stations would run out and there'd be riots and just like oh i don't want to ever do yeah. this so yeah. you know we i would say at that point we are more along the lines of preppers because we didn't want to live through a natural disaster again but the more along the lines of it me being an engineer her being from the um i guess a country setting it kind of mixed to where you know we we're planning against the risk yeah. of, of the future yeah. of trying to do that and I always think when anybody says, why homestead, I think, well, why not? If you look at the history of people, the way modern man lives now is not exactly the natural way that we used to live. You know, my, my grandparents grew up gardening and it wasn't, you know, 50 years ago, what, what we're all considering homesteading now was just considered life. <laughs> you know, like yeah. homesteading is yeah. like a new it's a new term for what people were doing 50, 60, 70 years ago. So for us, it's just getting back to the natural order of things. 
Uh, yeah, I, I do uh, some other radio shows. I do ones called Easy Street, and I like to talk about more of my prepping and stuff on there or concerns about. And one of the things that really bothered me, I'm, I'm sure you'd say the same thing, and you're proving it to me, uh, uh, is I, I learned through business and all things, never have all your eggs in one basket. And I kind of talked about that earlier. It's like we talked about YouTube. I said, oh, we're much more than that. Or I have a reason for that. I never put all my eggs in one basket because I've been burned. And I look at electricity as one of those things that Americans all depend on. And could you imagine life if for some reason a solar flare came along and we couldn't produce energy? I'm not saying disasters or shit, you know, or war or whatever. Just something comes along and we just can't transmit electricity anymore something weird and stuff. Could you imagine what we would all go through? And you guys would just be up there going, so what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty it's much. Like, nothing's changed here. And it's like, I, yeah. and so when I preach about, well, I guess it's preaching, I guess, but I, I like to urge people to be more self-sufficient, more homesteadish. And I tell people when you do it, don't necessarily go off the grid, get something on the grid and work yourself off of it. And, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot. I mean, depending and also age has a lot to do with it. Obviously, we've got some years on you. So I really don't want to be doing some of the things that you guys are doing at your age. Um, I've done those things before. And it's like, but now I'm at this age and I came back into country living at an, you know, at this age now. And I'm going, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> So I want to be on the grid, and I'll I'll put in systems that will allow me to go off the grid if something happens. And yeah. so uh, that's kind of what I try to tell people to do is, unless you know how to do engineering, <laughs> um, you might want to start with something on the grid first. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but um. we do. We we have a lot of people because we're off grid. A lot of will ask, you know, what kind of a, um, what should I buy? What size of a system do I need? You know, and, and really, I because we're off grid, we never really had the financial means to, or I guess we really didn't want to spend the money to put in um, on grid power. It just didn't make any sense. No, not at all. You know, two hundred or whatever it costs now, it made no sense to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to to get a utility bill. I agree. It yeah, I mean, sense. totally. Yeah, it made sense. <laughs> for us to figure out how we wanted to live and then build the system to allow us to live like we wanted to. Yeah. When we tell okay. a lot of people. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, we go tell ahead. a lot of people, they, they ask us about going off grid. We usually say, why? I mean, like, <laughs> if I, I mean, really, because for most people, they don't really need it. I see nothing wrong with, um, you know, a generator backup or whatever, but mm -hmm. if you don't need to go, as much as solar has come down in price, it's not there yet to where mm -hmm. it it's necessarily feasible for every person yet. Agreed. So if you're on grid, there's nothing wrong with being on grid. You just need to watch your power consumption, have a plan for the times that the power goes out. Because we used to live in Mississippi where the power is out like every week. Yeah. It's constant. Storms are always taking the power out. And we just learned how to cut our power back and how to adjust so that if our power was out for three days, we'd be fine. Yeah. Interesting. I uh, I got to make sure I, I don't want to try to go past an hour here, but so uh, I want to make sure you guys, um, uh, first of all, what, what are some of your short term and long term goals based on what you're doing today? Um, I didn't say long, these were easy questions. <laughs> long term goal is just to survive it. <laughs> I just want to agree with you. It's like, yeah. Uh, short term, I, I'd like to be better utilizing all of our property because right now we've mostly focus on the main 20. We're starting to branch out into the other 80 acres, but I'd like to be utilizing more of it, buying mm -hmm. less feed for the animals. Um, wrapping up the 10,000 projects that I have going at any given time. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. And this is That's good to hear nice. because hearing somebody with property and animals, you're, you know, and, and um, 
in, in talking about having that much property is like, why have it if you can't utilize it? And so I, I hear that in your talk here is you want to try, you want to find a way to utilize it, but people need to know there's a cost involved to make fences and, and make roads yeah. and, and things like that. And so biggest yeah. thing that people don't realize on homesteading is either one thing you'll never have enough of is time. Mm -hmm. Yes, right? so much you know, because you can spend all the money in the world to buy other people's time, but you can't spend more than you have of yourself. And so when she talks about she's got, you know, a, a lot of projects going on, I've got a lot of projects going on this year alone, I was furloughed for almost six months. So we were full time homesteaders for six months and still didn't make a dent in the to do list. <laughs> and, and, and I totally we understand. Yep. We said, you know, we had house extensions. I mean, like you said, we saw um, this new building was always kind of a plan. And we had set aside the, the means to buy all the materials and do all that stuff. And it was this year, it just so happened that COVID hit and, you know, everything kind of got weird. But the plan was to always do that. And so we went big on doing a lot of our other stuff. And here we are coming in, you know, it's almost mid November. We haven't even cut the first part, uh, first thing of firewood. Yeah, we're a little behind. But. You know, we're at here. <laughs> <You're not there. laughs> you know, we have no firewood put away this year. For this wow. year, we still have some left over. But, you know, we're fine on food. We did, you know, meat chickens this year. We still have a garden growing. You know, so we're fine on that. But time is the thing we never have enough of around here. Holy, and and we did make I, I was I would even say the same point even with five acres. Sherry and I, Sherry's not working either right now because of the COVID and we are so busy. It's like, when did we have time to work? There is never ever free time here. I mean, we just have to shut down and say, we're, we're taking a break. Uh, I mean, otherwise, yeah. uh, you know, today, I mean, I've got a business to run too. So I'm running a radio station and TV station. At the same time, I had to go and start working on the roof of the greenhouse. <laughs> And get that done because I, I sat we sat at the side for a little bit to take care of all the other projects, you know, and and we're caregivers too at the same time. So we got to take care yeah. of a mom, and she's in assisted living. So we're you know taking care of that. So yeah, we're spread real thin, and we just have five acres, and we're on the grid. <laughs> and so yeah. yeah, I just that's why I will not do what you're doing at my age. That's that's one thing I always want to put emphasis is like know what your limitations are, right? Oh, we, we talk about that all the time with people. We, The thing that scares us the most is when we get um, people that freshly retire that have been doing yeah. this like counting for 40 years and they've always wanted to be homesteaders in that and they go buy bare land. Here. Yeah. Here yeah. especially. Here. I've seen that a lot where people are like, we just retired. We just closed on 30 acres and we went to Home Depot and bought saws and two by fours <laughs> and we're going to build our home yeah that's I've a heard that a lot we, we actually <laughs> you know that's I that's the, the thing i think is people don't really sit down and ask themselves can i do this because they think oh i've i've been doing something for 40 years it's transferable and it's it's not at all i hear you that's one of my favorite um, so I, I read some of Joel Salatin's books, and that's one thing that Joel Salatin says in, in a couple of his things is he sees a lot of older people that think they're going to go into farming. And he says, you could have been an expert at accounting for the last 40 years, but that doesn't mean you know how to raise a chicken. Exactly. And it's, we see that a lot in homestead, too, where people come oh, in yeah. with business experience, but that does not help you move the pigs from pasture to pasture either. <laughs> I, hear you. I totally agree. So much agree with you guys. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap this up. I, I, I like it. I do try to keep my shows on time. So we're going to, uh, we'll be hitting the hour mark in about two, three minutes here. But before we go, first of all, it's a super pleasure to meet you folks. I'm so glad that we had a chance to talk. Um, you know, we've been kind of saying hi to each other in the comments and stuff, but and it's like, and, and, you know, I don't totally understand what you're doing. I know you don't totally understand what we're doing, but uh, I'm hoping to have a good friendship after this. And uh, I heard uh, and, and these folks also are collaborating with us, too. So um, they're just as friendly as we're trying to be to everybody else. So thank you so much uh, for uh, for that. 
and uh, uh, I, um, I ho- actually, I probably would not be surprised we do a follow-up show like this. Uh, once I kind of uh, catch up on more of your things, see how your winter goes, you may have something fascinating happen to you, and it's like, we got to talk. <laughs> so uh, I hope we uh, this is a long-term friendship. Three hours. You could What's do a road again? show. <laughs> you could do a road show in the summer. That's right. Not that so, far yeah. away. We're only three hours. Yeah, so uh, uh, we, um, I, I'm hoping this is the beginning of something much bigger uh, between friendships between our families. So I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to do an interview. I know you had a busy day going on today, and uh, yeah, and I, uh, I got roped into fixing a dump truck today. So, <laughs> <laughs> gee, I wonder where uh, why they thought you could do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually the mechanic around here, so yeah, yeah. I should bring my truck down, right? <laughs> That's what usually everybody does. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, shoot. Well, hey, it was a pleasure to have you guys. And by the way, when we stop here, you don't have to leave. It. Um, uh, we're on a platform that we're going to shut down in a minute here. But I want to thank you once again. I wish you guys a wonderful, I hope your winter goes well. I hope your spring goes wonderful with your gardens. And I hope everything that you're planning out goes well, too. So um, I'm really sending it out there as, as good vibes for you. Thanks. We appreciate that. Yep, thanks for having her back. <laughs> All right, guys. So anyway, uh, 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 we're going to wrap it up. I want to, once again, thank you for watching. And if you have any comments for these folks, please uh, leave it down in the descri- uh, down in the comments below. And please visit their websites and their Facebook and their Instagram. Everything we'll have in the description. So please subscribe to these folks. They're worth watching. You will learn a lot. So anyway, thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.